Films made about reconstruction after war often have an apocalyptic atmosphere. The world ended, at least the world that we knew. Post-war reconstruction isn't like building a new house after it burned down. It's more like trying to rebuild a family after they died in the fire. Ashes and Diamonds is a realist film. It shows the struggles of war, post-war, conflicts that exist externally and publicly, as well as the struggles of one's conscience, internally. Moral decisions that must be made on the fly without much consideration. Because lives are on the line. A character in the film remarks that only now, when things are more settled, he's had the time to think. Because before, all that he needed to know was that he had to survive. So what's this movie about? It takes place in Poland on the day Germany officially surrendered. Majcek and Andrzej are home army soldiers who fail to assassinate Stuka, a communist official. The home army isn't happy about the fact that after finally seeing the Germans retreat, the Soviet Union now occupies their country. Anyway, Majcek and Andrzej accidentally kill two civilians instead. Later, Majcek, the man with the sunglasses, spots Stuka and plans to carry out his orders. As he works out the details with his partner, he meets a woman named Kristina and falls in love. After they spend a night together, Majcek suddenly doesn't want to be involved in the assassination. He wants a new life, a real life. He wants to be happy. His partner, Andrzej, lectures Majcek about his responsibilities. Majcek eventually relents and agrees to hunt down Stuka and carry out his mission. In order to understand the politics surrounding this film, the source of its themes and, well, everything that happens in general, a brief history of the Polish resistance is required. Poland was the first real battleground of World War II. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland under a lie that the Nazis used to justify the invasion. Later that same month, the Soviet Union pushed into Poland as well. After the Polish government was toppled, the country's territory was largely divided between Germany and the Soviet Union. Almost immediately, Polish resistance sprang up. The largest faction used the name Home Army. It was actually the largest underground resistance to the Nazis in Europe. When Germany finally pulled out of Poland, the Soviet Union, now one of the Allied powers, occupied Poland. The Soviet Union saw the Home Army as an obstacle to complete control of the country. The war in Europe was effectively over, but Poland was still fighting for its future. Ashes and Diamonds grew out of the battle for Polish sovereignty. But it's not just a political film, especially not in some superficial vote-for-candidate-A sort of way. It's more about the soul of a country. The film borrows from the realist movement sweeping through Europe at the time that depicted post-war reconstruction at its bleakest. But the film is also conversely expressionistic and symbolic. It has contrasting styles, but that works for a film that tries to understand a culture because that means it's simultaneously trying to understand itself. Ashes and Diamonds draws from the country's poetry and spirituality in order to tell a more modern tale. In this church, Christina finds an inscription on the wall. So often are you as a blazing torch with flames, of burning rags falling about you flaming. You know not if flames bring freedom or death, consuming all that you must cherish. If ashes only will be left, and want chaos and tempest, or will the ashes hold the glory of a star-like diamond, the morning star of everlasting triumph? Fire can be the source of both destruction and creation. Heat can assist in the creation of both ashes and diamonds. So will Poland's battle be the source of its decimation or its freedom? Will Majcek himself burn out, or will his fight set him free? Fire as an instrument of destruction and change reoccurs several times in the film, leaving clues to its importance. When Majcek murders a man, mistakenly believing he's Stuka, fire erupts from his jacket. When Stuka tries to light his cigarette, it is Majcek who comes to his aid with a match. Fire, signifying that Majcek will later kill him. When Majcek and Christina search the church for a way to fix her shoe, they find an altar with two candelabras. A minute later, he realizes that the two men he killed are right there with him. Majcek, in remembrance of his fallen comrades, lights shot glasses on fire. Andrzej recites the names of the dead. When Majcek nearly lights the last two glasses, Andrzej blows out the match, stating, We are alive. The film also uses religious imagery, like in this famous scene. Wiesz, ja dotychczas nie zastanawiałam się nad wieloma sprawami. Życie się jakoś, 
jakoś samo układało. While in the church, we see a crucifix with Jesus Christ. He's hanging upside down. The world itself is upside down. Everything has changed. It's apocalyptic. A symbol of something all-encompassing, like the Son of God, to explain how everything is upside down. Everything is wrong. Even the camera rolling down from the cross in the beginning suggests a fallen world. That's not the only time we see Christian symbols, though. The first assassination attempt appears to happen near a chapel. When the man dies, we see a statue inside and a cross. This links the fire from the dead man's back to something divine. We see it again when we see rays of light coming out of the head of Christ. There may be something more going on. Mychek, much like Christ, is a martyr for his cause. Whereas Christina may be salvation. Christina, a name much like Christ. Maybe she is symbolically that diamond. And maybe Mychek is symbolically the ashes. There are visual clues here. When Mychek sees Christina for the last time, she is bathed in a warm glow. She shines like a diamond. Her warmth is the salvation of her people. She is the future. She rejects Mychek's violence. Mychek can't make her understand why he must do the things he believes he must do. And why should she? She is the light. He's the darkness. The ashes. Mychek is shrouded at the end, like a Christ figure, bleeding into the sheet. In short, rather than a one-to-one -one allegory, Ashes and Diamonds splits Christ into two halves. It's a bifurcated allegory. The Martyr and the Salvation. O czwartej trzydzieści mam pociąg. Nie mogłeś tego wszystkiego zmienić. In the end, Majek dies. But he doesn't die gloriously. The glory is for Christina. She's the diamond. Majek is only the ashes, and he writhes in pain and cries in a pile of garbage. His victory doesn't accomplish much. The fireworks mockingly erupt after his assassination of Stuka. Majek's death is foreshadowed. Early in the film, he speaks of flowers. Towards the end, Andre is given a violet by a child. He kisses it goodbye, then throws it in the trash. Majek dies in the garbage. But who is Majek, besides the living embodiment of a Christ-like martyrdom? He's a casualty. And not just because he dies at the end. He's a casualty of World War II. German occupation. He's a casualty of the Warsaw Uprising. He just happened to survive a little bit longer. Just enough to do one more job. The director said he was actually modeled in style after James Dean, the famous American movie star. The actor behind the character was eventually called the Polish James Dean, largely for his portrayal in this film. So with that in mind, one assumes that there is an air of rebellion in him, even though Majek claims to feel older, he seems to embody a more youthful defiance. Ashes and Diamonds has a great balance to its production. The director wanted to make certain that the home army was portrayed well, so as not to anger those loyal to it, but also not portray communism too negatively or else suffer censorship. And the film itself is about balance. In the end, we see some go into the light, while Majek suffers. If Ashes and Diamonds is about the future of Poland, it is clear that the director believed that the future was uncertain.